couple of updates that I, I didn't get into this morning, but I wanted to make sure everybody knew where things stood. But um, first thing I wanted to just let you all know tonight, um, Denny Miller talked to me this afternoon, and many of you know we've been praying for him. He was down in Hershey for a number of weeks, and they brought him up to Altoona this past weekend to hospice care, and uh, this afternoon he passed away. So Denny, Denny called me and talked to him. So be praying for Denny and his family and, and uh, Amanda and them too. I mean, there's, um, there's a lot of lives there. But um, certainly Denny's got to make a lot of these decisions now about the arrangements and all that. And, um, you know, so it's not like it, he was prepared, but you're never prepared when, you, n- you know, even though you're, you're prepared, you're not. <laughs> you're never really prepared. So be praying for that. And... Um, just two other updates I just want to give you for prayer. One is that Sarah um, Frey, many of you know, uh, was released from the hospital Thursday, and she's over at Epworth Manor now, and uh, the last I heard, it's, it's not going to be long-term. It's going to be in a, a few weeks, maybe, but uh, if you want to think about praying for her, going over to visit her or give her a card or something, uh, she'll be over there for the next few weeks. Uh, and um, just to give you an update on Candy, I talked to Roger here before the service. She's still in Altoona Hospital, and uh, just keep praying for her. They're trying to get an infection under control, and doctors, I think, need some wisdom for how to, how to make this thing, you know, uh, I don't know, to just, just fix, fix the problem. So uh, just, just be praying for her. Pray she gets her strength and has her appetite, and that we, uh, they're able to get this infection under control. So... Uh, I think that's all the prayer updates I've got, but uh, we, we need to hold each other up in prayer, you know. We uh, have to keep that in mind, so I hope you'll do that. We're going to turn to Matthew chapter 19 tonight. Matthew chapter 19. We're going to talk about some of the facets of marriage. Again, we're, we're almost wrapped up with our Doctrines That Matter series, and this is kind of, it's one of those, it's one of those doctrines that's it's not really even a doctrine as much as it is a, it's a point of, of notation because, and it's an important one in today's world. Um, if, you, if you go to, to seminary to, you know, and they, they say, we want you to write out a doctrinal statement, typically you don't have a section on marriage. Um, you have a doctrine of sin and you have a doctrine about God and doctrine about the Bible and the church and other things and times. But there's typically not a section on marriage, but uh, yet we have this in our doctrinal statement as well as many churches do now uh, regarding what we believe about marriage, what really matters about marriage, and why we believe it. And so we're going to look at this a little bit tonight uh, with the message that we've titled, What Really Matters About Marriage. So let's have a word of prayer, and we'll, uh, we'll look to this together then. Lord, we... Thank you for what's already gone on before us. We, we do pray for Denny and, and his family and those that are uh, dealing with this loss today. And I pray that you'd comfort him, help him to have wisdom as he makes decisions for these funeral arrangements. And uh, we just pray that you would continue to support and uplift him and help us to find ways to do that in tangible ways for him as well. We think of Candy there in the hospital. Lord, give the doctors wisdom, help her to get her strength back and allow this infection to get back under control. We pray for Sarah that she'd continue to improve with this broken leg and allow her to get her mobility back and allow this time at Epworth to be a good time of healing and uh, strengthening for her. And Lord, as we now look to your word together, help us to find uh, a blessing in it and some uh, practical truth from it that we might be able to understand better about what you've defined about marriage in your word. And we thank you for that. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. What really matters about marriage? Now, we're going to look at this in two sections tonight. And um, the first section, these are kind of long and wordy, but nonetheless, it's important. Here's what our church doctrinal statement says about marriage. It says, we believe that God has instituted the office of marriage but to be between one man and one woman. Intimate sexual activity is reserved exclusively to be within this marriage. As such, any sexual activity outside of marriage, including any form of homosexuality, lesbianism, bisexuality, bestiality, incest, fornication, adultery, and pornography are sinful perversions of God's gift of sex. Now, we're, gonna, we're not, we're not going to get into all those, those things tonight, 
But I do want to, you know, a lot of times we look at what marriage shouldn't be, what marriage is, what shouldn't happen, what are the perversions, what are the problems, and we don't concentrate enough, I think, on what does the Bible say about marriage, what is marriage supposed to be. And that's what I really want us to focus on tonight, because I think there are some truths here that we don't often think about. Um, so the first question I just need to address is this. Why is it that we even need this in our doctrinal statement? <laughs> and the answer is, read the newspaper. <laughs> Look at what's going on in our world today, and you realize we've got to put up a, 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 a peg in the sand somewhere to say, hey, here's what we believe, and we're not, we're not moving on this. If culture shifts one way or the other, if you know, they, they say this isn't what it is anymore, that doesn't mean that it ch changes what the Bible says about it. It doesn't mean it changes what God has instituted regarding marriage. Now, in our country, you don't have to be a man and a woman to be married anymore. Uh, it's, it's pretty legal to do a lot of things that you wouldn't even have conceived of uh, even just a short number of years ago. Um, but that's, that's just where our culture is. And I can see as we continue to deal with these issues of gender identity that are in the news today and who's, you know, how you identify with yourself and those types of things, you're going to find that this idea of what marriage even is becomes, continues to get watered down. It, it will continue to get, you know, um, abstracted in different ways. And, and I think that's going to be a real problem for churches at some point in time because at some point we are going to be blamed as intolerant, as out of touch, as archaic, as rigid, as unloving. We may get labeled a number of things, all of which uh, may be a perception from the culture, but nonetheless are things that we're going to have to realize these are, these are truths that we still can't compromise on whether we get labeled that way or not. And those are, that, that's why I think it's important that we talk about this tonight and, um, and really talk about what the Bible teaches about marriage. And I think the first uh, statement that we need to address is, the first part is that God instituted the office of marriage. Um, marriage, if you say, what is, what is a marriage? If you ask the average cultural, culturally um, with it person here today uh, or out in the world, what is, what is marriage? They, they, you might get all kinds of definitions. Um, well, it's, it's about two people that love each other. It's about, um, you know, people that just want to be with each other. I mean, there's all kinds of things. Um, you might say, well, it's just a legal thing. It doesn't really matter. We don't, we don't need it. It's just a piece of paper. Some people would say that. Um, and, and you know what? They would pretty much all be wrong. <laughs> Because marriage is something that God instituted. It's something that he designed, and he designed it with, in a specific way and with a specific purpose. So we're going to look at a couple of these thoughts. And I want to read these verses. I tur had you turn to Matthew 19. We're going to read those, and then we're, we'll, we'll go back um, and see where this all began. But um, in verses 3 through 6 of Matthew 19, it's actually a teaching on divorce. But in the course of teaching on this, uh, Jesus helps to under, help us understand what marriage, how it began. And so the Pharisees, it says in verse 3, came unto him, tempting him, saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? This is the question of, can we just divorce wives for any reason at all? I mean, that's basically what they're asking. Uh, can, you know, is, there any re is there any reason why we can't do it? I mean, we just do it because we don't, we don't want our wives anymore. We, and this was kind of becoming the fashion of the day. You think divorce is a problem today? Well, it was a problem in Jesus' day too. Uh, even the, the religious leaders were saying, Jesus, um, any reason, is there any, any restrictions on what we can't divorce people for? And uh, he was, you know, was trying to tempt him. And so here's where he answered. Verse 4, he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them, that would be God, he which made them at the beginning, so this goes way back before your time, he's saying, he made them male and female. Okay, that's interesting. Why didn't Jesus talk about divorce? He's talking about creation now. Okay, so he made a man and a woman. Well, where's he going with this? Let's look at verse 5. He said, it says, and said, this was God, God said, for this cause, 
shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Do you see what the cause is? Because of how they were created. Have you ever read it that way? A lot of times we just jump in and say marriage was created for this. No, men and women were created to be married. That's what he's saying. God created male and female, and for this cause, the cause being the verse before, for that cause, he, he says, they shall become one flesh. He says in verse 6, wherefore they are no more twain, they're not two anymore, but they're one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. We like to read that verse at weddings, and that's a good one to keep in mind uh, because it's an important one. In, when we look at a marriage union, it's a union that God joins. It's not some pastor that says, here, I'm you know, giving you the blessing and you're joined. It's, uh, <laughs> it's not, oh, I signed the certificate and the, the parson said or the, the justice of the peace said that I'm joined. No, the Bible says if we are married, our joining comes because of a union which God, uh, which God you know, pronounced upon us. God joined us together. So marriage is something that God instituted as an office, and he did it as part of the creation story. So let's go back to this creation story, which is in, um, let's look at Genesis chapter 2, because this is really what Jesus was referring to when he gave, us, gave those Pharisees that answer in Matthew 19. In Genesis chapter 2, we see just after, of course, Genesis 1 is all about creation, right? In the beginning, God created this, and on day 2, that, and day 3, day 4, he gets up to all these things, and he creates, he creates man. And then he, he rests on the seventh day, and he says um, uh, in verse, um, where are we at, 21 of chapter 2, um, we begin into the creation of woman. And in verse 21, of course, we know this story well. It says, The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now look at this verse 24. Therefore, again, you know why therefore, we've talked about this. When you see a therefore, you have to ask, what's the therefore, therefore? So we look at the verse before and we say, what's, what's this conclusion of? And the answer was, he just said, God just created a man and a woman and we are to be one. That's, that's our purpose, is to be one. Adam recognized this from the time they were created. She's taken from him, and she is created for him, and there is to be a union between them. And so he says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Now, I'm just going to throw this out here for the rabbit trail seekers here tonight. Why did Adam talk about a mother and a father? Did Adam have a mother and a father? Somehow he had a concept of what this was supposed to be about, right? I'm just going to leave that there. You, you can ponder that on your own time. Adam, Adam all of a sudden talked about a father and a mother, and he had just for the first time been introduced to a female. And all of a sudden he knew what a father and mother were to be and how we were going to procreate down the, down the line. But anyway, I'll leave that there. That's not for the message tonight. But the, <laughs> yeah, I know, you're going to want to talk about that sometime. We'll, we'll do it sometime. But, uh, but nonetheless, I think there's a lot of interesting things here. Adam wasn't just a dummy. He, he knew what things were going on. And when we see what happens in Scripture, how he responds to God's intervention in his life, you can see where Adam was, was led by him in, in so many of these things. So God institutes this office of marriage as a part of his creation plan. You know, this is not just a, oh, we got along all right, and, you know, boy, those guys look good, and the girls look good. We thought we should get together and, you know, go do something together and have a marriage for the rest of our life. No, it wasn't man's idea. It was God's idea. 
He, he, he put woman there. He put man there. And as soon as it became together, it was obvious. This is to be a marriage. This is to be a union. And so that's why we see in Genesis 4.1, it says, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Now, here's where I want to, to just park for a minute tonight. Behind this word, no. You know, in the Old Testament, every time you see that word, no, with Adam knew his wife and so-and-so knew somebody, you know, it's talking about a certain type of intimacy, union, that produces a child, Right? And um, we're not going to get real explicit tonight, but I want you to understand something about this. You know, sometimes we say, yeah, well, so, so-and-so knew somebody, and we have this little smirk, right, that, that begin, oh, yeah, we knew this, you know, that's how. But the fact is, do you know what this word knew means? This is very interesting. You look at the original Hebrew behind the word no, it's the word yada, okay, yada. And it is translated no in the Old Testament well over 900 times. And I can tell you, out of those 900 times, only a small portion of them are about Adam knowing his wife or somebody knowing somebody in that fashion. And most of the time, many of the times at least, it's used in a number of other senses that we would typically use the word no today. It's used in a, in a figuratively, it's used uh, euphemistically, and it means to perceive, to acquire knowledge, to know, as we would say, to be acquainted with uh, someone. So when we read the word, we read the word and the psalmist says, be still and know that I am God. It's the same word. It's yada. It's the same word that whenever God says, I want my people to know me. I want people to cling to me and have a unity with me and understand me. And I want, I want them to know me and I, just as I know them. How many times does God talk about in the Old Testament him knowing us? It's, a, it's an intimate, personal relationship that says I, I'm, I'm really in tune. I'm in unity with. I, I have this deep, personal, intimate connection with someone. And marriage, in this sense, because it's the same word, is a, it's a little microcosm of our, what our relationship is to be with the Lord. God says, I want you to seek me and to know me. I want you to, to have this intimate relationship with me. I want you to, to understand my deepest will for you and my deepest desires for you. I want, I want my thoughts to be your thoughts, even though they're not. <laughs> I want, I want my holiness to be into your life. I want, I want to, us to have this, this deep personal relationship. That's always been God's desire. And, of course, we know that sin severed that relationship, made it so that we, we didn't have that ability to have an ability to know God where he wanted us to. But we have a marriage which is supposed to be based on this idea of knowing, of knowing intimately, of of having this um, deep personal connection with uh, that other person. So in that way, it's a, it's a little way which we live out what we are supposed to have between us and the Lord. So we believe God's instituted the office of marriage, and since it came from God, there's two things that we can know for sure. It's not an outdated device. It's not some outdated, archaic thing. <laughs> it's still pertinent for our lives today. It's, it's not something that doesn't mean anything anymore. Marriage is still important. Uh, there's a reason why the Bible says that, you know, we, we need to um, leave your father and mother, cling to your, your spouse, and, and, and move on and have a union with, uh, with, a, with a marriage. Now, we know not everybody gets married, and that's, that's fine, too. We're not dealing with that tonight. But the point is, for those that do get married, this is something that, this is the device, this is the means by which we are to have union with, uh, with our spouse through the marriage. So it's not an outdated device, and because it came from God, again, it has an objective definition. In other words, we don't get to decide what it means. Just because the Supreme Court puts the gavel down and says, well, we decided marriage means this today, okay, a lot of smart guys sitting up there and women, but that doesn't mean they're right. <laughs> The Bible has to trump whatever the Supreme Court says. They say, okay, it means this. Well, I'm sorry. It's, uh, it's not something we can just say because marriage has an objective definition 
that's uh, instituted there by God. So we believe that, and we will also believe then that marriage is to be between one man and one woman. And um, that's why we, we, we're not going to turn back there, but Matthew chapter 19 and verse 4, Jesus answered, when he answered them, he said, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? He made them male and female. And so when you look at how God instituted marriage from the very creation of the two sexes and how he created marriage as a, as a, as a union that's to be lifelong between a, a husband and a wife, then we also have to recognize that it, by nature, excludes other definitions of marriage. <laughs> it's not about multiple women or multiple men. It's not about you know, men with men or women with women. Those aren't proper definitions. It's, a, it's an exclusive definition between one man and one woman for a lifetime. And it also means then that marriage is not just about two people who love each other. Um, this is, I know this is, this is thin ice for us in our culture today. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, yes, lo- there is a component of love in marriage, we hope. <laughs> we hope it stays there and is always there. But the fact of the matter is, it is not a prerequisite for marriage. And in fact, it is not the it is not the thing that will continue to make marriage work for the long term. Uh, love is, a, is an important component, and it's certainly a God-given component, but the marriage relationship is primarily at its core, it's a covenant. It's a promise. It's a commitment that two people make to each other. Uh, in the same way that God makes covenants to us or has made through, through the ages. Marriage is this, is this covenant that a man and a woman make to each other. To say, hey, I am committed to you. I am committed to know you. And again, this is that idea of knowing, having unity with, having, I'm going to work on developing this deep connection with you and do that exclusively with you and no one else. Now, doesn't that, again, give us a picture of what God wants with us? God wants us to be committed exclusively to him. He wants us to be committed exclusively to knowing him. Not be out wandering and looking at other gods. Why is that the first commandment? Thou shalt have no other gods before me, right? Because God says, my, uh, my relationship with you doesn't have room for anybody else. You know, if we're going to say, well, I love you, Lord, but I love all these other things as well. What are we saying about God? Eh, I'm not all that committed. <laughs> I'm not 100%. I'll give you 90, 95 maybe, you know, that's good, you know. If you do that in your marriage, will your marriage work? <laughs> no. You can't just say, well, 95% of the time I'm committed to my spouse, but the other 5%, you know, I'm going to do whatever I see or love or want at the moment. That's not going to work. And that's the same reason our relationship with the Lord has to be exclusive. It's a covenant. It's a commitment. It's a promise to say, I'm going to stand up here and say, till death do us part. In other words, until I can no longer physically be committed to you because you are not on this earth anymore, my commitment stands, stands true. And you know what? Young people, I'll just tell you something that's a fact. There will be days when you will love your spouse, and there will be days that you won't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a, I don't mean to let the cat out of the bag for you married folks. But you know what? If your marriage only depends on the days that you love your spouse, you're going to have a rough marriage. <laughs> it's not going to work for you. On the days that you say, man, that love's not there, what do you have to hang your hat on that day? You have to hang your hat on the commitment that you've made the covenant, the promise that you've made to that spouse. Because you don't have, if if it's all about feelings and having good days, it's going to be a roller coaster ride. (laughs) And uh, and you're you're, you're heading towards a, a crash at the end. And that's the problem. So Malachi 2.14, I'm going to, Uh, You you wouldn't think Malachi talks much about marriage, but it does. Here's what he says. The Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, 
In other words, he's a witness to your covenant against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, speaking about um, the people of Israel who had been dealing with divorce and problems. And, of course, they were not following the Lord at this time. And he says this, Yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. He says, You've dealt treacherously with your spouse. Malachi was chastising the people of Israel in this statement to say, Hey, you, you people have not honored these covenants of marriage that you've put yourself into. Uh, divorce was a problem in Malachi's day, the same way it is today. It, it continues to be a problem, not because we have a bad culture, not, not only, <laughs> not only because we have sin all around us, but because we don't in our heart recognize that marriage is primarily about a commitment to that other person. Well, he says, you violated that covenant, and the Lord has been the witness to that covenant. That's why it's so important that we recognize the, uh, the, the union that we have between one man, one woman for life. It's, it's about developing that union. And it includes the physical intimacy, but it also includes spiritual union, having the sense of we believe the same things, we trust the same God, we have the same faith. Ideological union, you have to kind of become one in terms, how, in terms of how you're going to conduct your lives, what are your values, what are your what are your ideals in life? Those are things that you're going to have to grow together. Emotionally, you're going to have to grow together in your union. You're going to have to figure out a way to, you know, when your spouse has a down day, you're going to have to figure out how to be the up person that day. You're going to have to balance each other out emotionally. Uh, financially, you're going to have a union. So many marriages today, well, that we have her money, he has mine, and this is, we don't, you know, we're all separate. Well, Okay, so you have a union in marriage, and you're supposed to have everything in, in union with each other except for the finances because, you know, he has his toys, she has hers. I don't know. I mean, I'm not saying you can't spend some money. I'm not, this isn't meddling tonight. But the point is we have to have a sense of if it's union, you're all in with every facet of your life. Or it just really isn't truly union now, is it? So there, the idea with marriage is, you take these two unique creatures, men and women. You know, there's a book that says men were from Mars and women are from Venus. You ever hear that book? And the idea is, you know, we don't all think the same, right? We know that. Men and women don't think the same. We don't always have the same types of, you know, way of looking at life. And here we are put together by a commitment in a union. And now we are to say, how does this work? Well, the answer is, just as it is with our relationship with the Lord, we are not to be two individuals trying to make this to work together. No, we are to be losing our individualness and becoming one in what we are. In, in all that we do, all that we think, and how we act, our oneness should trump our individuality. In other words, your unity in your marriage should be what's most important. A good marriage is one in which you think and act in concert with each other as a couple. If you've been married long enough, eventually you could say, "I, I knew, I knew, what, I knew what they're thinking." That you, you know, I, I, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I knew that's how they were going to act or react or how they were going to, you know, be in this situation. And you know, you begin to have the mind of each other. Now the question is whether you look at that with disdain over the years, <laughs> or whether you say yes. Um, we need to have this mindset together. This is something that we will agree to have. So, uh, again, I'm not going to get into all the other parts of this tonight. There's so much you can speak about marriage, and there's so, so much out there that's not good teaching. But um, I think it's important that we really draw a, fi a firm line as to what we believe about marriage. God instituted it. It's between... A, it, it, it's based in the actual creation of, of man and woman, and it is, it's designed as a covenant between a man and a woman. And it's not based on emotions or love or anything like that. It's based on a covenant that we, uh, that we make. So uh, as a result, you know, if we, if we really strive and we really get right what marriage is supposed to be about, all of this other stuff that is not that is going to, you don't, you're, you're not going to have to teach about that. You're not going to have to preach about it because it's going to be self-evident. Okay. Oh yeah. Well, okay. So 
Um, the, the rest of our statement says sexual activity outside of marriage, including any form of da 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 they're all things that we shouldn't, we shouldn't be a part of. They're perversions. Well, that becomes obvious. When we, when we hone in on the exclusivity we are to have with our spouse and the covenant that we have made and the fact that God is the witness to that and that this is rooted in the very creation of the world, we are no longer going to be out all these perversions are going to look like perversions. They're going to be self-evident. We aren't going to have to call them out because they're going to be, they're going to be um, obvious to us. So I hope without getting into all of the explicitness of what things are tonight, we understand a little bit more about the, the purpose of marriage. And uh, when the culture begins to twist it, redefine it, make it something that it's not, keep it clear in your mind. Don't let your mind be, you know, drifting into those, oh, well, may, maybe they're right. Maybe it is just about, may, you know, and because a lot of times their arguments sound reasonable. <laughs> the arguments of the, these, these guys in the Supreme Court that said this is what marriage is about a number of years ago. I forget what year they redefined marriage. Was it in the last five years probably? Um, they're not dummies. They have logic. They have reason. They have arguments before them. They're, they're, I mean, they didn't end up on the Supreme Court because, you know, they didn't have a brain in their head. <laughs> and so that's the point is a lot of these arguments for how marriage should be redefined are going to sound reasonable to us. They're going to sound logical and they're going to sound, well, okay, maybe I don't agree with it, but I can't argue with it. <laughs> well, the fact is things can sound reasonable and logical, but they may not be biblical. So let's always evaluate what we hear based on what the Bible has to say about it and not based on whether we process is the right way in our mind because we can easily get led astray if we just rely on our own logic. Allow God to lead based on what he's shown us clearly in his word. So with that, let's have a word of prayer and we'll close this tonight. Lord, we thank you for instituting marriage. We realize it's a covenant. We realize that it's an institution you put together and we're thankful for it. We pray that we wouldn't be deluded by the, uh, by the new definitions and what, what the world says is right around our marriages and uh, whether there even is a need for marriage anymore. I, I just pray that we wouldn't allow ourselves to go down those lines of reasoning. Help us to stand firm for what the truth of marriage is about and help us to strive for those of us that are married tonight for that exclusive union and knowing each other the way you want us to know you. I pray that we might, uh, we might strive for that in a, in a new way and that we might find greater joy in, in knowing that we can be one with each other and knowing that we can be one with you. And uh, we thank you for that. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.